Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, here to the public forum of our group exhibit Hydrogen and Fuel Cells for our podium discussion about challenges for the electrolyzers industry. And I have five gentlemen here on stage, all from the electrolyzers energy uh, industry, and I would like to introduce them to you. Uh, right next to me, I would like to welcome Dr. Hans-Jörg Fell. He is Technical Director, CTO of uh, NEL Hydrogen AS. And uh, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Bernd Pitschak, he is Managing Director of Hydrogenics GmbH. I am happy to have on uh, the stage uh, um, Roland Kepner, he is Managing Director of McPhee Energy Germany GmbH. And uh, Mr. Anderson, Everett Anderson, is Vice President Ele Electrochemical Technology of Proton Onsite. Good to have you here. And last but not least, Dr. Graham Cooley, CEO of ITM Power. They are all here to discuss with me the challenges for the electrolyzers industry. My name is Ulrich Walter and I would like to welcome you here and whenever you have a question just raise your hand and I'll come with the microphone directly to you and you can discuss with the gentleman your certain question. Well I was thinking how should we start if I have five different gentlemen on stage all from the electrolyzer industry and I thought why why don't we do an elevator pitch? Do you know an elevator pitch? You know you, you, you get a meeting by, by instance in an elevator and, and get the CEO of some, some very important customer of you and you can tell him what is your product and why your product is the very best. So, But you only have one minute because then it reaches the highest floor and he will leave you and if you haven't uh, convinced him till then, he's gone forever. So I, th I, I thought we will do an elevator pitch and uh, Dr. Fell, you're just right next to me, you're the first to do the elevator pitch. So tell us what electrolyzers do you have and why you you are, you are the best. Okay, you have one minute from now. Yes. <laughs> oh, you don't have any, any tone. Probably it doesn't work, so um, you got my microphone. Here you go. Yes, one, one more try. One more try, one minute from now. Nel Hydrogen is a Norwegian-based company and we have uh, many years of experience in large-scale industrial electrolyzers. <laughs> We supply alkaline electrolyzer systems and our history goes back to the early 20s and last century. Our systems are known for their reliability, energy efficiency and uh, we are able to supply systems to whatever capacity needed. Last but not least, we have now launched a new product, a pressurized alkaline system which targets renewable market. This goes back to many years of development and is a very compact electrolyzer which has a flexibility in operation very similar to what you experience in PEM systems. You have five seconds left but never mind. Give him a hand please. That was NEL. Thank you very much. We have one microphone if another one won't work. Very good. Okay, this is the first one. So, Dr. Pitchak, your second one. You have a minute from now on. Thank you very much. What a challenge. Uh, Hydrogenics is a global acting company headquartered in Toronto, Canada with two manufacturing sites in Oeuvre, Belgium and in Germany in Gladbeck. We have two separate business lines on fuel cells and electrolyzers. And electrolyzers we concentrate on industrial applications mainly have entered back in 2002 the hydrogen fueling stations business, have supplied over 50 fueling stations with our electrolyzers and moving now for two years now or since two years into the power to gas uh, business, the energy storage business which requires multiple megawatt installations. We have a long-lasting history until the mid-40s of last century and as my four speakers said, our electrolyzers from the industrial uh, applications are very robust, reliable. We have a proven availability of our electrolyzers of 97% and a good track record over 300 worldwide installation in all uh, applications and areas worldwide from Patagonia to Siberia to the Middle East so we know how to handle the different circumstances. Very good, here you are, this is your hand, your applause. Okay, uh, Mr. Kepner, you're on the next one, McPhee Energy, Deutschland GmbH. I'm curious, you are have one minute from now on. Yes, hello. Uh, oh, again? Okay. 
Do I get the five seconds back? And from now on, okay. <laughs> okay, McPhee Energy is a pure European player. We are based in France, where we have our uh, headquarters. Uh, we have a, a company in Italy now and also in Germany. Um, McPhee started 2008 with uh, commercialization of uh, metal hydride hydrogen storage systems. And I think in the short time of our existence, we have proved that we, we are able to do that very quickly, very fastly, uh, reliable and safe hydrogen storage. Um, we just acquired the uh, beginning of this year Peel. Um, Peel is an Italian electrolyzer manufacturer, well-known, speaks for its own. It's uh, also a very reliable, well-known system based on alkaline technology. Um, and we see in the combination of both um, having two building blocks like electrolyzer, hydrogen generation with a mature technology and hydrogen storage that we can offer packaged solutions. And That's one minute. Thank you very much. Okay. Your applause. Okay, and we are now hearing um, uh, Mr. Everett Anderson, Vice President of Proton Onsite. One minute from now on. Here you go. Thank you very much. Oh, we can't hear you. No, no, okay, take the hand Thank microphone. You. Uh, I would say from now on. Here you go. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Proton uh, Onsite, formerly Proton Energy Systems is uh, a company that focuses uh, specifically on proton exchange membrane electrolysis uh, from our start back in 1996. Uh, we consider ourselves a global supplier of uh, electrolyzers. We're in uh, 75 countries around the world with a global distribution system. Um, and we've branched uh, beyond electrolyzers to providing uh, complete solutions for our customers in the industrial gas market. Um, uh, we also are active in the energy markets for hydrogen, uh, doing a number of fueling stations and now more recently uh, looking to megawatt scale electrolysis as we've kicked off uh, our latest product development uh, for that this year and hope to have uh, a commercial product on the market uh, within a two year time frame. Very good. You're within the one minute. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Your applause. So, and now, Dr. Cooley, that's up to you. You have one minute from now on. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, ITM Power is a UK company. We're based in Sheffield. Uh, we've just set up a company um, in the US and also in Germany. Uh, we were the first hydrogen and fuel cell related company to be listed on the London stock market. Um, our interest is in coupling electrolyzers to renewable power. We're interested in the clean fuel and energy storage markets. So in clean fuel, we make a fully integrated system. So it's an electrolyzer and a fully integrated storage and dispenser. Um, in terms of energy storage, we're interested in power to gas. Um, we utilize some of the classic advantages of PEM electrolysis. So we're interested in producing very pure hydrogen that doesn't need to be cleaned. Um, high pressure hydrogen and in fact our energy storage technology makes hydrogen at 80 bar so it can be directly injected into the um, high pressure gas grid um, and uh, most importantly um, our electrolyzers respond very rapidly in fact they re respond in the time scale required for grid balancing okay that's one minute very good that's your applause <laughs> Okay, I hope all of you have made your choice already and know from what electrolyzer you will buy next. <laughs> but if, if you're not quite sure, still uh, we will start the discussion here. Um, Mr. Dr. Pichak, uh, water electrolyzers has been living in a small niche markets uh, so far, but uh, at the moment there's a sudden interest in, in electrolyzers. Uh, how comes? that comes uh, as a so-called German energy energy vendor, uh, we have realized that we need to balance surplus energy and it's better to store the energy instead of wasting the energy. So hydrogen offers a good storage solution for surplus energy and an electrolyzer will consume the surplus energy, generate the hydrogen and then you can store it either in the natural gas grid or in a storage buffer or in a salt cavern, whatever fits to your application and you can use the hydrogen later on and you can also when you bring it back to the natural gas grid distribute it over large areas and this is a main driver since uh, 
May or call it post Fukushima, so April, May last year, where we really saw a push toward that. And, and you're already involved in some of these big projects like uh, Falkenhagen or Welte, where you produce the so-called wind gas. What are your experiences so far? So far they are quite good. Uh, all projects are running on time. So it's uh, in Welte it's a one megawatt installation. Falkenhagen is a two megawatt installation. Yesterday we had a press conference and both are based on alkaline, so existing proven technology. Uh, yesterday we had a press conference where we introduced the new E.ON project for Hamburg. There will be an installation of a one megawatt PEM electrolyzer, which will be delivered next year. Uh, it's also a power-to-gas project with a direct feed-in of the hydrogen into the distribution net of the city of Hamburg, so they will get green gas. It will also use surplus energy. And our feedback from the industry, from our partners we work on, is quite positive. Projects on time, technology is working so good. It's good to hear that a megawatt project is now running with PEM electrolyzers, isn't it, Mr. Anderson? How do you see your, uh, your uh, business chances uh, in, in, with these current developments? Well, we're certainly interested in scaling up as well. We see that as uh, uh, probably one of uh, the, the major challenges with the PEM technology today. Um, we certainly have a great track record with uh, our industrial electrolyzers out in the market. Um, uh, allowing customers to operate them over wide-ranging dynamic ranges and on-off cycles has shown the reliability. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, we're focused on uh, scaling that technology up. Um, and, and I think the key challenge is to be able to scale it up but also to reduce the cost. And, uh, and, and by implementing these cost reduction technologies, uh, not impact the reliability that's already been shown in, in the marketplace. Right. So. Mr. Anderson, but we, we, it is not the only application to, to store wind gas, but uh, like cooling power plants, is uh, also hydrogen is needed, or, or um, uh, reaction gas for industry processes, that's also big business you're in, aren't they? Absolutely. Power plant uh, uh, generator cooling is one of our major markets. Uh, most uh, electric utilities are cooled with hydrogen around the world, and we're in hundreds of plants uh, in that market. And we also supply to uh, semiconductor processing, metals heat treatment, and, and those areas as well as as well as the laboratory gas market. So again, very well established, very profitable businesses for us. Allows us to to uh, we have been a profitable company now for the last several years. So we have the sustainability for these energy markets uh, if and when they come in the future. We feel we'll be ready for them. Dr. Cooley, and there's some more business you are in, like uh, backup power uh, systems or um, fueling hydrogen filling stations. Uh, you also need electrolyzers if you, if you want to produce it on site. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest opportunity for electrolysis going forward is energy storage. I think uh, um, as we're trying to simulate more and more um, wind power onto the network, um, you see nations that have assimilated more than 20% beginning to turn down a lot of renewable power. It's very difficult to um, assimilate renewables into a conventional um, electricity network. So I spent 25 years looking at energy storage um, in the power industry and the most important thing that's happened in, in my view is hydrogen and power to gas. And the reason for that is that you can store energy for very long periods of time. As you know, in the UK, our power grid, our power grid carries a third as much energy as our gas grid does. We can put our whole power grid into our gas grid every day three times. And that would be the big business in, in the end, wouldn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> it's, a, it's massive business. Uh, the, the, um, the gas grid carries 1,000 terawatt hours a year. And that's a lot of electrolysis, even if you're only trying to store a few percent. Yeah, very much, Dr. Fell, and you're also very much interested in it. Whenever you look uh, here on, on the fairground, you see megawatt, 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 also uh, you for, for megawatt applications. Uh, but if you have an electrolyzer who will, uh, who is, is fitted for, for hydrogen production from wind and sun power, it has to respond to rapid changes of power input. Uh, can your electrolyzers handle that? Okay. Um, do we need another microphone, please? Thanks. Yes, indeed. As I said, our development has gone back many years. We have started with the Utsira project 
uh, where our first generation pressurized uh, electrolyzer was installed and taking back these learning points into the new development we have come forward to a system which has proven extreme flexibility and is performing well under these uh, circumstances. This being said, I think we are just in the beginning of harnessing renewable energies and you will see that the amount of uh, or the, the capacity needed to transform the energy into hydrogen is uh, much bigger and will require very huge systems. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, I would foresee a combination of systems which are very flexible. This could be a, a, an electrolyzer, this could be a battery system, in combined with also electrolyzers which are running flat or are moduled a bit slower and and thus you can have a energy management which is beyond of just connecting a very quick electrolyzer to the grid. So I think it will be more complex than just going for one single system. I see. Uh, Mr. Kepner, you have the same type of electrolyzers, it's also alkaline. Um, are, they, are they ready to, to fit the big markets? They're, they're the cheapest one on the market, aren't they? Yes, um, I mean alkaline technology is a mature technology, and I, I, very a often you have closer, the, the, closer, very, very often you have the, um, the the impression in the market. There's a lot of discussions about the technology needs to be developed, the applications, they're mature. In, in particular, the alkaline technology is a, is a technology which was delivered for, for 20, 30, 40 years with right, reliable systems. It, it's mature. It's a question of sizing it up. You know, and even the PEM technology is not that new. The new thing is that uh, PEM systems need to grow, need to be scaled up. Mr. Anderson, with PEM technology, which Mr. Kepner just announced, uh, addressed, it, it's a problem the electrode coating, as far as I know. So uh, um, there, during switch on and off, there's a permanent uh, oxide coating that could be generated the, uh, during that period. Uh, can you cope with that problem? Well, we certainly, um, from the systems that we produce today, we allow our customers to operate them in any mode imaginable, and they often do, uh, which includes uh, uh, m numerous on, on and off cycling uh, multiple times a day, you know, multiple days a week. So I think, the, again, the, the architecture and the, uh, uh, the product technology that we have today can certainly match uh, those rigorous conditions. Uh, the key is, uh, obviously, to, to drive down costs and look for uh, less expensive coating technology that uh, can do that. Uh, we've been evaluating a number of different uh, uh, coatings uh, for our, you know, uh, uh, basically bipolar plate-like type materials, and, uh, and we're very encouraged by uh, uh, the materials that, that we're testing, the coatings that we're testing, and we see, uh, you know, some dramatic cost reductions uh, with, uh, with what we've already demonstrated in the, in, the, in, the, in the lab, and we see those rolling into our megawatt scale product as we move forward. I'm, I'm still with the lifetime a little bit, because <coughs> so how many hours can you guarantee to your customer? Well, we typically, I mean, we, we've certainly demonstrated uh, uh, well over 60,000 hours of continuous operation with the PEM electrolysis stacks technology. Uh, we typically, uh, uh, we, have, we have systems that have been out now uh, in, the, in customers' hands for 10 years. Uh, with the same stack technology. So again, I mean, I think uh, uh, we, we, durability of the stack is, is, in our mind, is not an issue. It's only a matter of can you, do you impact that as you implement uh, uh, cheaper materials, as you implement lower catalyst loadings, as you, as you do things to, to take cost out from, from that perspective. Uh, Dr. Cooley, how, how long are your, your electrolyzers running already and uh, do you guarantee a lifetime span? Yeah, sure. So 60,000 hours ago, we didn't even have product, of course, <laughs> with a new entrant here. So, um, But uh, we're very confident about our electrolyzers. We, we, we measure voltage rise, which is what every electrolyzer manufacturer Total. does. Sorry, we, we measure voltage rise, which is what every manufacturer does, looking at if there's any appreciative voltage rise, which gives you an indication um, of long-term life. Um, and uh, we see very little voltage rise, so uh, almost unmeasurable. Um, but th I think the issue you're looking at here is return on capital employed, actually. So, and that 
deter that's determined by what business model you use in the market. And it can be slightly different for a new entrant and somebody who's been around for as long as Proton has. <laughs> certainly it can, yes. Okay, so other business models other than just selling um, include leasing and financing arrangements as well. Uh, but certainly we've uh, um, had good experience selling our products um, even though they are a new entrant product into the market. And in fact, recently you will have seen we announced the sale of a power to gas unit to the Tuga. So I think there is confidence in our uh, technology. Right. If there are any questions, please raise your hand. I'll come with the microphone right uh, to you. If you have any questions, I'll be there at the moment. Yes, Mr. Mergel. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jürgen Mergel, Research Center Jülich. So we have heard uh, a lot of technical challenges. So, but uh, the hydrogen costs are depending on the costs of the current, the costs or the efficiency of the electrolyzer, but also by the investment costs. So, can you please give me a number in for 2015 what uh, megawatt electrolyzer will be cost per kilowatt? Okay, this question goes to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to start? Well, I think all of us will uh, answer in a similar way. It's not an easy question to answer since, <laughs> since you have to specify how you put your system up, what type of uh, compression is needed, etc., etc. So, um, a rough estimate, you could say one megawatt plant would cost uh, one million uh, euro. Order of magnitude, give and take. Okay. And, and of course, um, the, uh, you, see, you see, the way we produce electrolyzer plants is building factories, especially large ones. As soon as we start serious production, there will be huge potential of cost reduction, and I expect the cost to go down rapidly in that moment. But at the moment, one megawatt plant, one million, that's the number. What would you say, Dr. Vichet? Can you go down lower? <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have already heard numbers which are lower a couple of years ago from, from Siemens, uh, what their expectations is. So the range is already set uh, around the one million and lower for, for megawatt installation. But the main driver for that is, of course, quantity. If we talk tw quantity one, the price will be different if we talk 50, 60, 70 per year, whatever, the price will go down. But more important to me than the investment cost, the pure investment cost, is basically the price for the cubic meter or kilowatt hour of hydrogen you have to pay for the final application where you will use it. And the main driver, as you correctly mentioned, is the cost of electricity. And the second driver is the investment cost, but only if the operational hours per year are less than 2,000, 2,500 hours. If you overcome this limit, the investment cost will stay back and the capex, uh, sorry, the opex will come up front. And therefore, it's more important to find a business model where you get cheap electricity, have long runtime hours, and maximum pricing for the kilowatt hour hydrogen produced. Okay, Mr. Kettner. Okay, oh, no. Oh, the, even oh. this doesn't work. Okay. Yeah, no, it works. <laughs> okay, it uh, may look a bit fishy, but I also tend to go for the one million. <laughs> um, no, but um, basically, I think it's sometimes a wrong discussion about the cost of hydrogen. And then clearly, most of us focus at the moment at the industrial on-site generation. And obviously, we are competitive in generating hydrogen at uh, the com competitive costs with our existing solutions. If we're talking about the energy storage applications, I think it's a, it's, a, it, it's a wrong thing to look only at the cost of hydrogen because the electrolyzer solution in energy storage adds value. You know, it's doing a service, it's getting rid of the problem of excess renewable energy, so that needs to have a price. So only talking about the cost of hydrogen generated, I think is, it's the wrong approach. Okay. Uh, you, okay, Mr. Anderson, you have the chance to answer. Okay, well, um, I, I guess uh, trying to look for something to add to this conversation that's, that's what happened already, I would agree that in terms of, uh, at, at least from what we hear from the market, the price is being set. So it's not a matter of 
of what we think it's going to be. It's matter of you know how we get to uh, that price in the market of the the dollar per watt or whatever the uh, the metric that you want to use. You won't get a customer if you don't tell them the price. Okay. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, uh, but I think what 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 we've done is we've also looked at. Um, where the price for the for our technology or our products have come down as we've gone up in scale from one normal meter to five normal meters to 10 to 20 to 30. And what we see is uh, we've already demonstrated um, with a factor of five increase in output, you see anywhere from 35 to over 50% reduction in the in the cost, uh, capital cost of hydrogen. And we see that trend continuing as we go higher and higher in, in, in our uh, products. So I think just, just scale alone gets you a, a, a long way there in terms of trying to get to these these uh, capital cost targets that we're talking yeah. about. But I also agree that there are value streams that we have to look at that are non-traditional versus our industrial markets today, and those will make a key factor in as we go forward. Okay. But the prices you all agree, like say around one megawatt will be a million. What do you say, Dr. Cooley? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that number. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I think that... <laughs> The other thing you have to look at is, is value and not cost. And the question the gentleman asked was, how much is the hydrogen? And he's talking about the capital cost of an electrolyzer. So you put a rapid response front end on an electrolyzer, you get an availability payment, and you get a payment for grid balancing, which makes it more valuable to spend that money. Also, if you have a, a high pressure electrolyzer, you don't have to buy a buffer store or a compressor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have to ask the question, first of all, hydrogen at what pressure? Mm -hmm. Hydrogen at what purity? Mm -hmm. And how much are you paying for the electricity? Okay, okay? so I you're not comparing like with like. And, and if you can buy electrolyzers for one million a megawatt, People who buy them will make a fortune by operating them, okay. so long as they're rapid response, high pressure, and high purity. Okay. We start with the pressure. Uh, what pressure can you...? Uh... Uh, this unit is um, 80 bar, self-pressurizing, which is the pressure of the high-pressure gas grid okay. in most countries in, uh, in, in Europe. So you just inject A it straight in. Okay. 80 bar is pretty good. Mr. Anderson, what can you do? Well, we've certainly demonstrated we have a products today that produce hydrogen at, a, at, at uh, nearly 200 bar. Uh, again, it's a matter of a, of a cost trade in terms of what are you paying for that extra uh, okay, but hydrogen pressure. you can reach 200 bar without compression. Absolutely. Very good. Okay, Mr. Kepner? Well, actually, it's 700 bars, and you can fill a car directly with an electrolyzer. Not <laughs> our systems run up to 12 bars at the moment. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I was just wondering. 700. <laughs> what would you say, Mr. Victor? Uh, we decided so far with the uh, PEM electrolyzer to go up to 30 bars, mm -hmm. and the reason for that is that you have to do a financial calculation on the cost for the compressor mm -hmm. as well as the cost to make your system a high-pressure system. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the with the 30 bars, you can overcome the first stage of the compressor, so you take out a lot of cost for the compression. And uh, if it makes sense to go to 100 bar, what would be required to feed in every uh, gas network in, in Germany uh, is a question It's not still answered, and we are working with our partners in the project to find a financial answer on that, what is really required. But we believe the 30 bar is a good step forward. Dr. Phil, you still have the opportunity to answer on the on the pressure side. How can you reach? Well, uh, similar as Dr. Pichak, we had a uh, similar reasoning, and uh, looking at the applications we are delivering to, and uh, taking into account the cost required to make a high pressure system, we landed on 15 bars, and I think this is a very good base for further compression, if required. Okay. What about the purity? Security. What, what, what pur purity, purity can you produce? Whatever you, uh, you desire. Then, of course, we need to supply uh, the purification unit. Uh, all right. Okay, you you need a purification unit behind that? Depending on work requirements. Okay. So 99.9 uh, .9 out of the cell stack, then you have to remove uh, humidity if required. And uh, this is standard. Uh, option in our system. Okay, 99.9, .9, everybody can do. Sure. Sure. Everybody. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, w with dehumidification, 6 nines purity. <laughs> okay, 6 nines. No, Whoever needs uh, it, no? Okay. And Proton will yeah, be able to do good. the same. Mm. Okay.
Any more questions from your side? Please raise your hand if you have any questions. Just raise your hand. Okay, then, um, the, Mr. Kepner, there's, there's sometimes uh, questioning the maturity of electrolyzer industry, but what we hear here now, it's all a very well established uh, um, industry, and there shouldn't be any, any questions about maturity, are, are there? What do you think? Okay. Yeah, certainly, and that's what I said in my beginning statement, that um, the technology is mature, it's reliable. Um, of course, now we are, we're looking at uh, the several challenges in, in making the systems bigger. Now, how do you make them bigger? Okay, you can increase the stack size, uh, you can invest a lot of money into uh, manufacturing equipment doing that. Uh, you can to, you can try to to run extreme cost reductions. Uh, the question is, um, who's going to pay that? Uh, because we're looking at a very immature market. Actually, the technology is mature, but the market is not uh, mature, market and is that's not, one yeah. of the main pro yeah. problems. So we have to do stepwise scaling yeah. because uh, you know most of us here are small companies. Um, um, we want to be alive in the next ten years. So uh, if we make huge investments into an insecure market at the moment, uh, we're going to be dead in, in, in three years. Yeah, right. Mr. Kepner, what I think is interesting about your personal career is that you were uh, responsible for Siemens electrolyzers only uh, until last year. Now you're um, with McPhee and uh, they have alkaline electrolyzers, as we've learned. Uh, did you change uh, the job uh, for the better technology? <laughs> <laughs> no, certainly not. <laughs> so, first of all, I mean, um, okay, Siemens uh, promised to bring large-scale PEM electrolyzers, and what I left behind, I have to say that, um, to make it clear, is an excellent team. And if there would be someone who can manage to build these large-scale electrolyzers on, based on PEM technology, it's, it's going to be the Siemens guys, I'm absolutely sure. Um, <laughs> No, no, Still I didn't. with your company. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't escape from that. Um, and the question is not, is PEM or alkaline the right technology? Is it high pressure, low pressure? Mm -hmm. Now, at the moment, uh, the market demands different technologies for different reasons. And in the future, if the energy market comes up, it, it's going to be the same. There will be PEM technology, there will be alkaline technology, depending on the cost mm -hmm. and the business model, the pressure you need for filling stations like that, but you also have industrial applications, the power to gas. So there will be a, a whole variety of technologies. Uh, we just have to make sure that we arrive at the right cost level to make the business model working. But I still would like to emphasize on this uh, PAM alkaline thing, Dr. Fell. You were producing PAM electrolyzers in the past and now you switched uh, to alkaline. Uh, when will you, when will you switch back? The reason for this is very simple. We, uh, as a matter of fact, we developed a prototype, PEM prototype, successfully, but saw a number of challenges. And we see in within 2020 to produce large-scale systems which can fulfill the requirements of the renewable energy systems, there's no way we can achieve that with PEM technology and prove it. That's my view. Um, so our strategy is to utilize the, well, our elements which we have proven in alkaline technology and use those to scale up our latest launch and thereby be able to serve the market. Dr. Pitchak, you can do both. Huh? You do alkaline and, and uh, PEM uh, electrolyzers. What do you think in, in 20 years' time? We will only talk about one, one technology or will there still be both technologies on the market? Uh, I doubt that. I see that uh, the variety of technologies uh, will grow up. We see that also in the fuel cell cars, the battery cars. It's not if or then. It's, it's, it's a parallel approach, as uh, Mr. Kepner said. Depending on the market segment you are in, you will have a tailorized solution for that. That can be PEM, that can be alkaline. The big advantage of uh, PEM, what we see and what is our target in our uh, next deployment is that the size of the PEM stack is 30 times less than an alkaline. And that means if you go to installations of 5, 10, 15 megawatts, when you're in the distribution level of the electrical grid, uh, you have a tremendous benefit in footprint 
on the stack size and you can build up system for power to gas applications or for providing a negative control energy to stabilize the grid. So the world is open for that. In industrial applications where you just look for 10 norm cubic meters per hour uh, for, do, for doing a transformator cooling, alkaline is a perfect product to go for. So uh, you have the variety, but it's important that you have the chance to choose Therefore, you need the offering of both technologies, and then you have to make the, the choose uh, depending on what you really need. Mr. Anderson, what I've learned, they, the PEM electrolyzers, they can uh, uh, cope much easier with overload. They can take 300% or so overload, much better than alkaline can. Yes, yeah, certainly the dynamic range of the PEM electrolyzer is an advantage in terms of as we talk about this overload or overcapacity. Uh, as, you know, obviously, you have to design the balance of plan around that to handle that, and you have to understand what the time constant is that you're designing to. Uh, I think another advantage uh, that we see is uh, uh, the ability to do differential pressure uh, across the, uh, the, the mem membrane uh, itself with its high bubble point. Um, we typically uh, generate hydrogen at elevated pressure, but our oxygen water loop is, is near ambient uh, all the time. Uh, the reason we do that is it simplifies the system from a safety perspective, uh, simplifies the system from a uh, uh, basically uh, uh, operating perspective, turn down perspective, and it also simplifies in cost because we can use uh, cheaper plastic components on the, on the water oxygen loop uh, that saves money as well. Gentlemen, we run out of time. It's, time is over already. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting discussion. I would uh, say to all of you, reduce the cost. That's maybe the mo most important uh, thing about and stay reliable uh, as you are already. Thank you very much for this uh, discussion here on stage. Thank you very much for your interest.